Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to Roll welcome Call. Welcome to My name's Roll Kayla Call. McNabb. I, I use she, her pronouns. And I will be your host and this I will be your host this evening. Um, we're going, um, to, we're kick going to kick things off in our discussion of the sheep look, sheep look up uh, by up. having each player uh, having remind, each the player remind the audience of uh, who they uh, played uh, who they uh, and who they are in uh, real life. And then Anthony will reintroduce himself and the work of literature that we'll be discussing tonight. So... Let's see. So, I guess see. Do you want to go Philip and then Jonathan go Philip and then I'll go because I played. And then I'll go because sure. I played. Sure. So I'll do both introduction myself and my character yeah. right now. Yes, please. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. So I'm Philip Hernandez de Wright. I use he him pronouns. At Virginia Tech, I am assistant dean of students and working in the dean of students office. So we help students when there are problems outside of the classroom that are affecting their academic performance. Um, and that's me. My character is he uses he him pronouns. I have to pull the character sheet to look at it because um, it was been a while. Um, he's the pesky bee, uses he him pronouns. And then where do I find the class and race? Class is at the very top of your character um, sheet, class under is at the very details. Top of your yeah. Sheet, under yeah. details. So he's a class is martial artist. He was an athlete. He was an athlete. And the race is athlete. Well, okay. athlete for background, background. Uh, uh, for background. nationality uh, for this nationality for the game for system this, that we used. For the game system that we used. So it's on the top so of the second it's sheet. It's on the top of the second sheet. Um, nationality and Demetra. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so your double life was as a street so juggler. So your double life was as a street juggler. Yeah. Yes. Do, do, are we talking now about is that a good, good different introduction? Or are we talking about how we came up with character now? How... That's good. That's probably good enough. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so, okay. That's excellent. That's, that's yeah. Excellent. And we excellent. can get into more about characters <laughs> here more about characters momentarily. Here momentarily. Uh, Jonathan. Uh, John? Yeah, so I am yeah, uh, John so Bradley. I'm, I'm head of John studios Bradley. innovative technologies for university libraries. Uh, I use he, him pronouns, and I played Clara, who was the face uh, of the group uh, in, the, in the mission. Uh, she, her pronouns for my character. And um, she was Australian uh, and had multiple secret identities, some of which came up in uh, the mission and some of which didn't. Uh, but didn't. get into uh, that but if we get into that. If we get into that. Awesome. Uh, and as I said, uh, I'm Kayla McNabb. I'm, I'm head of instructional content design for the university libraries. And uh, for this and, uh, game, I played Highcroft, um, an infiltrator, um, an infiltrator um, who had um, a who had kind of secret a identity a as a civil servant, a um, servant and, um, uh, and was really, uh, was really interested, in interested in being a ghost, not being ghost. paid attention to. Paid attention uh, that to. only went so uh, well during our session. Um, session. Um, but uh, she but, uses she her uh, pronouns, she uses, she her um, pronouns. And, um, and yeah, we'll get into uh, some more of that as we move through things. Anthony. Yeah, uh, I'm Anthony yeah, Wright de Hernandez. Uh, I'm, Anthony I'm uh, Hernandez. the Community I'm, Collections uh, Archivist for Special Collections, for collections and University, university Archives, and university uh, archives with, the uh, uh, with the University um, Libraries. Um, and I was um, the handler. Uh, for our spies for in this, uh, this role-playing game. Uh, role uh, game, essentially, I was the, the game uh, master the, and the um, master and um, put together the scenario, together the scenario uh, based on the book uh, on and the book played and all of the NPCs. Played all of the NPCs. So, and we're getting a message that we have an echo uh, in the chat. Do we still have an echo, or is this another? We still have an echo, or is this another? Start off with an echo situation. Start off with an echo situation, and then it goes away. Um, Let's let chat let us know let's let chat on let that. And also, do we know who's that? And also, do we know who's still have one? I don't know. Yeah. Um, if we um, can narrow down if who's we can echoing, narrow down that who's echoing, will that help. And if it's everybody, that is also and helpful. And if it's everybody, that is also helpful. Um, um, let me go take a look. And see what I can see in the audio. 
All right. She's hearing it with everyone. She's hearing um, everyone. So to make sure we have um, some so audio sure have for some testing audio purposes. For testing purposes. Anthony, would like Anthony, would you like to tentatively start, like to describing, tentatively the start the describing the premise of the book? Um, and we'll see if we need to we'll pause need and restart to as we're doing the audio testing. As we're doing the audio testing. I can attempt. I yeah. can attempt. Yeah. Um, um, so essentially, so the sheep look up is a dystopian, is a dystopian science fiction science fiction uh, novel from 1972 uh, the world is the a world pretty is a disastrous place in the book uh, there's a lot of pollution um um, uh, the kind of the, uh, the kind of the food growing capabilities, food growing are, are, capabilities are, are falling apart falling apart um, um, everything is filled with, everything is filled uh, with chemicals, uh, and chemicals and poisons and toxins, poisons and, whatnot. And, toxins <clears throat> and whatnot. So, um, so um, it, 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 it is seen as a book that kind of sparked an, an environmentalism uh, movement. Uh, movement. Um, it um, really it has kind of an really environmental kind of message to it. And, to it um, and, um, it, it is a classic it, it in a dystopian classic fiction, in but dystopian not fiction, one that's quite as well known as, as, well like as books like 1984 or Brave New World, or uh, but, it uh, but it definitely it fits within the same genre, the same and, genre and, and, and feeling. Um, it's feeling, very centered um, in the United States, even though John Brunner is an English author, and there's... There's various wars across various the world wars that, across the the world that the U.S. has been involved in instigating. The, uh, president, the uh, president Prexy in, in the novel is very autocratic, um, more, concerned um, more concerned with how, with the, US how the U.S. will be viewed and profits for and major profits corporations for major than corporations with than the actual well-being of, well of uh, people, at home, uh, abroad. people at home or um, abroad. Um, many places are many places war are torn, and war-torn because of and that, because and the chemical that, weapons being chemical used weapons in the wars, in the uh, wars uh, natural environments uh, have been destroyed. Been the Mediterranean destroyed. has the been Mediterranean completely, has been completely uh, uh, destroyed. destroyed. Essentially, it, it's essentially unable, it's to, support unable to support life anymore. Uh, weather patterns have, uh, been, weather disrupted patterns have been disrupted, and crops are difficult to grow. Acid rain falls and ruins crops. So. Uh, pretty, so bleak pretty bleak environment that I put you all into. That I put you all into. I I should say so. Um, I I should say so. And we um, kind of coming we, into this session. Kind of I know I personally had not read the work before the session. Had anyone else who was playing? Um, any of the other players? Had you read the work? What kind of level of familiarity did you have with it before the session? With it before the session. Uh, I had not read it. Uh, I have um, not read it. Uh, I have read uh, I have read other dystopian uh, other fiction dystopian novels, um, fiction like novels, Clockwork Orange and stuff like that, but I had not read. Um, I had actually even heard of it, which of sort of surprised it, me with sort of surprised given my background. Um, that it had never come up, but I guess, I mean, it's a science fiction story, which science fiction is not always given uh, as much respect as it should be uh, in traditional literary programs, so I, mean, I think that's probably a facet in that. I mean, I was never asked to... take a quick moment to adjust audio? A quick moment to adjust audio? I peek that. behind the curtain. Uh, yeah. For example, uh, yeah. for example, yeah. when I uh, when I actually read when the Clockwork Orange, it was not for uh, any sort of coursework. It was just because I work. was interested. Just because um, I was interested. Um, um, I'm trying to think of what I'm potential, of what potential um, uh, science fiction novels I did read over the course of my degree. Uh, looking at the audio levels now, they seem much more reasonable. So maybe we'll get rid of the echo. The chat can let us know. Yeah, if they can, if folks can give us a, an update in chat, that would be fabulous. Um, and kind of bringing up other dystopian, it's like still echoing, um, bringing up other dystopian uh, works, uh, novels, and other works. Um, uh, uh, novels, novels, how novels. did your um, 
I guess, experience with this work, if there was some experience other than reading it um, that you've had either through media or adaptation, um, did that kind of color your experience of the session? Oh, it's fixed. Apparently it's fixed. Um, uh, headphones and probably fixed it. Yeah. Mm, it's uh, unhappy about something. I don't know. <laughs> oh yeah, you got so you need to hit the stop record start record. I think you I think you dropped from the stream. Ah. Oh, yep. It looks like we've yeah. got two university libraries logos happening. The audio is also a bit choppy. Yeah. Well, I just say connecting. So hopefully we pick back up. All right. Looks like we got a connection again. Technical difficulties are <laughs> a thing with Twitch quite often. This time it's yeah. not Twitch's fault. <laughs> it's, it's just the te technology we have available. Just being live. <laughs> That it happens. We'll roll with it. Um, let's see. In the preview, I'm seeing there's still no video feed. Getting excessive packet loss. Looks like. Mm. Oh, I'm gonna drop back out. It's very reminiscent of when we actually played the game, too, because we had technical difficulties then, if I remember correctly. Let's see if I'll connect back. It says it's listening. Do 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 do. Do you have a technical it. difficulty screen yet? Uh, I mean, we got a be right back screen. Okay. I can turn that on. <laughs> we'll be right back. Vamp. Um. Yeah, I had so many questions. Um, we did have some turbulence.
right. I think we have everything sorted out. Uh, if we don't, please let us know. Um, when we uh, took a moment, we were talking about adaptations and um, experience with similar works. Um, so if anyone, uh, curious, that sounds good. So okay. if anyone um, has experience with adaptations of this work in particular or other similar uh, dystopian sci-fi kind of um, work, um, did that previous experience impact uh, how you approached the session, how you created your character, um, how you played through it? Well, so I guess one question I have, uh, this might be more for Anthony. Are there adaptations of this work already? Is there like a movie? Is there, do you know of anything? I'm not aware of anything. Ooh, pioneer. Um, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I, I haven't gone specifically looking, but uh, dystopia and, um, well, dystopia is probably a, it, it's one of my favorite genres. I'd say more like environmental disaster, end of world disaster movie type things i really enjoy but like um, sharknados <laughs> i haven't <laughs> seen the sharknado series but but like the airport series uh or uh, there's various earthquake movies uh there's a wonderful lightning storm movie called into the storm i guess that was a tornado movie but um anyway the, i enjoy b disaster movies i enjoy like Things like um, The Day After Tomorrow that are a little bit high, higher production. I enjoy that type of stuff. I've seen most adaptations of like Fahrenheit 451 or um, uh, like I will watch dystopian adaptations as well. I've never heard of or seen one for this work. Oh, interesting. Well, I mean, as for the answer to the question, like did my previous experience... I would argue no. I went into this, I think, thinking more about like, like 007 movies than I mm -hmm. did like dystopian works, and and my character and thinking about like this character who just walks in everywhere. Like I like the description of the gray man in the uh, black cat cat gaming like module um, of the gray man, and I was like, this. I don't know what the character is going to be yet, but this is this is what I want to be because I think it'll have a lot of opportunity for role play, which is what I was looking for. I definitely think that is kind of the more, the direction that I went with creating this scenario as well. Um, the world it was set in was the world from The Sheep Look Up, but I definitely was, um, once I saw the Spy Game uh, 5e setting, um, it seemed to mesh with the kind of post-apocalyptic or pre-apocalyptic dystopia uh, of The Sheep Look Up, it seemed like that was not too much of a stretch for what they had already planned for that module. Um, and so I went about making a spy uh, spy thriller type game that just happened to be set in the world of The Sheep Look Up. Uh, so inspiration from other media, I would say... Um, the setting they created, the setting created by Black Cats Gaming, as well as um, things like Ocean's Eleven, uh, those types of films. Uh, I'm less familiar with like James Bond, so it's more that like heist movie of uh, the Ocean's series. Yeah, um, that was definitely part of the inspiration for the scenario that I put together. I can't stop thinking of that Rick and Morty scene now where they're like, you son of a bitch, I'm in. <laughs> like, that whole <laughs> That's like... So I look for inspiration... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Yep. I look for inspiration from Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven, that movie, because of the spy heist type thing. So my first thought was Saw, who's the character who you can, like, you know, he becomes like this Russian rich guy. He keeps really good at the characters. But Jonathan, you put in your character... She really, really early, so I saw that you had really kind of taken that wow. that trope. Um, so I didn't, I didn't go with that. So instead, I went with uh, the the amazing Yen in the movie, who's the acrobatic. So that's where I put my character from. Was the we got the guy who can do the costumes and disguises, but we didn't have anybody who could do the acrobatics and jumps and 
dexterity stuff. stuff. You do need both. Oh, always good to have. Yeah. 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 So, so that's that's, that's where that's the direction, direction I went. Yeah. Um, I can say personally, I definitely drew more from the spy sort of genre than the uh, dystopian. Dystopian futures, in my mind, are always most closely related to um, uh, Brave New World or uh, The Handmaid's Tale. So I was excited to not be in those worlds. Um, you know, so uh, definitely thinking through <laughs> Uh, how to disappear into a surrounding and then effectively and decisively do a task and then leave without being seen was what I hoped for. Um, <laughs> it was not necessarily how things happened in the session. Um, but a couple things folks have said um, makes me want to dive in a little bit more to the game system. So Spy Game was a uh, Fairly new, still a fairly new system was very new when we were um, playing a couple months ago. At this point, um, what I think it had been out for maybe a week or two. Yeah, it at most two weeks. Yeah, so it was it was very new to to all of us. Um, so I guess what in kind of adapting to that new system, what were you able to bring from your previous experience in role-playing games? What was difficult to, to kind of adapt to as a, as a game master or as players? Um, gadgets. I didn't, I didn't, it didn't click for me, the gadgets and the, the basis for the gadgets in the system. Like, everything else had a pretty much, like, a one-to-one, -one like, connection in my mind. It was like, oh, nationality, that's sort of like race. Except you don't get anything for it, but you also shouldn't get anything for race in D&D. &D. Hot take. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I think they're moving towards. But, um, but and, like, you know, your class was a class. You had feats and abilities. And, like, everything else seemed pretty much directly there. And then there were gadgets. And my initial thought was, these are magic items. But you got a certain amount of them, and you changed them out, and all that sort of stuff. And that was a weird sort of adap adaptation for me, because you're used to, like, getting a magic item and it being a big deal, and then you carrying it with you forever until you die. And this idea that, like, you could choose a certain number that you wanted for a given mission, and then change them out and you never see that thing again. <coughs> like, I like it. I like that idea because it makes you less... I think in, I think in traditional role-playing games you get too attached to your magic items sometimes mm -hmm. and um this idea that these are just sort of disposed and and getting them is a really big deal which is partially why you get so attached to them so this idea that like you're just going to get some you're going to use them you're going to change them out you just need to figure out what you need for any given mission i think makes them seem less like this monolithic thing and more like a tool that you can be creative with yeah it the gadgets and the hacking um i'm very familiar with how like spellcraft works in D D 5e but hacking which is the rough equivalent of magic for this adaptation of the 5e rule set um is a little bit more complex and took a little bit to get my mind around gadgets uh I like this system for them and it makes a lot of sense with the you choose which gadgets you're going to take with you on a mission based on the reconnaissance and information that you had for that mission. Because this was a one shot, um, I didn't really, I knew that we weren't going to have time to do, do the initial scouting and planning and, and really give you a chance to select those gadgets. So the, the gadget selection is kind of like um, when James Bond goes and visits Q and is presented with like the the shoe that's got the phone in it, I guess that's um, Get Smart. But anyway, <laughs> uh, it, it's that kind of scene where if you think about this cinematically in the in the form of like a spy movie, um, gadget selection is that when you visit the like tech whiz that has all the special like secret gadgets that you can. Uh, take with you on the mission and um, if it was a long campaign 
it makes a lot of sense where you've got that home base. You do the um, scouting or intelligence gathering first, and then you do selection of what gadgets are going to be useful for this mission, and then you go on the mission. Uh, because this was a one shot, I had to condense part of that and cut out part of that. And I s started you in town instead of having you travel there. And, um, so there are definitely things that I learned from those aspects, uh, but gadgets and hacking, um, and the, the car chase, which we didn't actually end up getting to play, um, I think were the most challenging for me to, to kind of grasp coming from standard 5e. So it looks right. like Philip dropped out. You may need to oh. stop and start recording again in OBS. I just, I just did. did. Is, okay. is it recording, recording now? now? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's coming back up. You'll be back in a few seconds. Um, Excellent. We're just rolling with it. Um, let's see. Seeing if we're his videos back live or not you can go ahead and ask your next question it'll pop back up in a second okay um and definitely philip feel free to touch on uh the game system kind of stuff as as we think through the next couple it's kind of relevant to them as well um so what were your expectations going into the session um so that could be technical it could be thematic it could be anything I can go. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I was honestly somewhat terrified. Um, this was literally the second game I ever uh, did as Game Master. Um, it was a brand new adaptation of 5e, uh, and I was doing it live on the internet, and we did not end up having a chance to do a playtest of it. Um, so... There were multiple things. That, on top of, it was the first time that Role of Play was done live. Yep. Um, we had pre-recorded the session before. Uh, so there was the added layer of the technical stuff going on with trying to do remote streaming f live for the first time. Um, and ha having it fall... Uh, in this dystopian world that had a many parallels to what was currently happening in the world um, right around election day in the US uh, just there were a lot of stressors <laughs> for timing and technical issues and, and all of that and it being the second game I ever DM'd um, I feel like I managed to put together a coherent narrative um unsurprisingly the players chose to go in directions i had not anticipated fully um i thought i was i, I was fairly prepared for multiple things that you might do but um i needed something to kind of kick you in the butt and make you move forward because we spent way too much time at the beginning not quite getting to the action um and that was something that if i had had a chance to play test i could have adjusted um other than that i think it went pretty well yeah i'm gonna give philip a chance to answer if he has anything about the um adapting the last question expectations yeah yeah yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't read, read the, the book. book. I had, I had played, played a one shot with the other before where he did the Ridley Scott alien one. So that's, that's what it's kind of comparing to, I guess. Um, I hadn't read the book, so I didn't know like who the enemies were going to be or what it was going to be like. like. And, and when, when I tried, tried to probe Anthony about it, he didn't give me any hints. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was, I was thinking, thinking oh, Ocean's Eight, Ocean's, Ocean's Eleven. Sorry, Ocean's Eleven. Yeah. Ocean's Eight works too. Yeah, I think I was expecting. I'm not sure what I was expecting. I I had gone and like looked at a summary because I was like, mostly I was just curious about the book after the idea that we were going to play it. Um, 
and so I was expecting um, more sort of like Big Brother like watching activity and I think I also expected a little bit more of like movie set fun because we'd sort of been given that impression that we were going to be and we were based out of a movie set um, and so for some reason that was where my mind went in terms of setting uh, so I was like okay so we're going to be like you know in, on a movie set and something's going to be happening on the movie set and we're going to be figuring out like what we're doing related to this and, and, and so I had those sort of expectations going into it um that was but. an available path for you. The so you all started in town, but you were ostensibly employees of this major motion picture studio based in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um and so that was there as fuel for you potentially putting together cover identities, uh like you could have been on a location scout or something like that, um in Tower Hill, I think, is the name of the town. Uh, so that was there as as the backstory for your characters, because in Spy Game, all of the spies have a spy agency that they work for. And the one that I created for you was called Sanitation, and it was <clears throat> uh, a secret agency. So it was hidden by the actual movie studio that was that was above it they were able to hide gadgets and things like that by disguising them as movie props and that was just the background for your your spies but yeah Missed definitely available to us, work I with <laughs> should have done, so, done something more with that you had access to things like helicopters because it was a major movie studio yeah so had you decided that you needed a helicopter you could have gotten one yeah, I think I was also picturing like the old Goldeneye game where you're in like all these underground facilities where there's like helicopters underneath of it. And that's what I figured our base would be like. Like you go underneath and there's like a, a real <laughs> helicopter that we switch out for fake helicopters or something like that whenever we need to like go somewhere and do something. Um, I think that was probably part of it. I used to play the old Goldeneye game a lot, so I think it <laughs> uh, influenced a lot of my thinking about this in general. So kind of related to these things, what was the biggest surprise that you had during the session? Either from the content or what anyone did. My biggest surprise was that I was not very good at my job. <laughs> uh, I thought I'd be better at it. I think my biggest surprise was probably that Saturn just was ready to s flip sides. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, that, that was, was definitely, definitely the biggest, biggest surprise. surprise. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the setup for that, I had, um, I had Saturn as a major character from the beginning. Like Saturn was always going to be someone you encountered basically any way that you uh, went forward. Um, <clears throat> but part of the really easy flipping of sides was because we were in a time crunch at that point. Um, <laughs> and, but it was set up, uh, Saturn was supposed to be recruitable. Um, I had notes for what would happen if you killed her, but, um, basically all you had to do was prove to her that the corporation that she was, working for because the corporations in this world had spies uh, and she was a corporate spy um, basically just had to prove to her that they were actually really harming people uh, and mm. convincing her showing her the effect of the uh, contamination in the water and the fact that the company was still planning to ship it out even though they knew um, was enough to get her help in destroying the contaminated product, uh, whether or not that would lead to more cooperation down the road uh, is an open question. But as far as destroying the contaminated product that was going to be shipped out, um, that was a relatively easy flip to get. Yeah, I think I, I think I went into it with this thought process of like good spies and evil spies and like... Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I appreciate it, because I always appreciate when an antagonist has more um, motivation than I'm a bad person, which is a lot of a lot of antagonists like motivation. But like, I don't think it struck me that like, I think I think the lore in the spy game, at least from what I read, was like these are the evil organizations that you're working against. So my thought going into it was like these people are never going to flip. They know what's going on and they're okay with it because they work for. I guess it's like it's almost like Inspector Gadget esque. Like you're working for Claw, and it's just mm-hmm. like you know you know you're not doing great things, and that's fine. Yeah. Yeah, no, no I, I, I was never going to put together, um, I, I was never going to do like a, a Captain Planet villain. Um, oh. it, yeah. people are more nuanced than that. And, and I, mean, I yeah, think, I appreciate that you didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would have found that boring myself. So I thought this would be more, more when I got at the, the source, source of where, where the water was coming, coming from. from. I was, I was expecting, expecting some more soil green, green or a slurm or... <laughs> Those are the yeah, two pop culture references. <laughs> um, That's great. If classic sci-fi, future. If you had chosen to explore further, you potentially could have discovered uh, stuff, but it, it would have taken things on a very different track, and you would have either needed to bring the entire party with you, or. Um, because ultimately, like, the source of the contamination was uh, barrels of a chemical agent that had been buried in a cave system that was nearby the aquifer many, many years ago, and uh, geologic activity, like earthquake activity in the area, had broken the barrels, uh, which were, I believe, from World War II. Uh, So they were really old barrels and the chemical agent had leaked into the water. And that's all from the book. Like the source of the contamination for the water in the aquifer is, is all straight from the book. I, I didn't create that part. Um, But had you explored enough, I would have let you find that. That actually leads in really nicely to uh, my next question. Uh, for you, Anthony, did you think that there would be any unique challenges in adapting this work to a tabletop RPG? Um, <clears throat> honestly, I don't know that there was anything really unique, uh, more unique than adapting any other sort of work of literature. Um, I, I definitely wanted to tie back to the source material as much as possible. So the location, uh, I think I had mentioned the avalanche that had destroyed this ski lodge. Um, There was the plant next door that made the the Nutripon. Um, There was basically the entire setting of the area was from the book, the military encampment that was getting ready to destroy the Nutripon with their laser tanks. Um, the only thing I dropped into that setting that was new was this water manufacturing plant. Um, that was created by me as a target for you that was peripheral to the setting, but not directly from the book. Um, the hardest part for me was figuring out where in the book to to insert you and your story. Uh, because over the course of the book, you go from a relatively normal world where people go about their business and do shopping and things like that to uh, within a year, the country at martial law and the Denver area being... Uh, mostly destroyed with most of the population dead and um so figuring out exactly when in the book your mission would happen to where you could have a sense of accomplishing something even though it wouldn't directly alter the end of the story presented by the book that was one of the more challenging things i didn't want i didn't want to have you come in and do something that would lead to a different outcome for the novel. Uh, but I wanted you to have something that you could succeed at. And that's so interesting. that's interesting yeah. that you bring that up because we've gone back and forth about like what it means to adapt 
literature, the yeah. one shots, and um, you you mentioned that you didn't want us to change the ending of the book, right? And um, see, I don't I don't know. I'm not saying I I would <laughs> disagree with that, but I I do wonder like, are we gonna have that come up? Because I mean, I think I there's multiple multiple ways to go about doing these adaptations. I don't think it necessarily has to be off limits for somebody. Like, there's no reason that I couldn't have had you uh, be able to save the day and and completely make things all better. I just don't think that for me personally, that would be as compelling of a story. I think um, if somebody was to watch the one shot and they're familiar with the sheep look up and they know what the outcome is... I want them to see, I wanted them to be able to see this story as something that happened that was peripheral peripheral to the story presented in the book. Like this could have just been an, another story that was happening alongside the book. Um, and so I wanted it to be something where you could have success and have a satisfying gameplay experience. But I personally wouldn't have wanted to alter the story because the story has so much meaning in its allegory and its presentation of this dystopian future. Um, I, th- I wanted to preserve that. I felt it was important to preserve that. And I wouldn't have wanted my story to alter that. So, so my challenge was fitting in, fitting in a story where you could succeed in preventing this major thing from happening without really altering the final outcome of the the story presented by the original author. Yeah, I think that's going to be one of the most interesting things about this series to me is um, seeing the different methodologies people have for how they Mm -hmm. adapt a work. And it is kind of like um, fan fiction, almost, right? There are certain aspects of like doing this sort of uh, collaborative play that's just like a weird subset of fan fiction. Um, and sometimes that is set completely within the world of a story. Now and sometimes you that it. does. No. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Fan fiction's great. There's some really great no, fan fiction. Oh, no. But, um, but yeah, but I so think that it, it is, is interesting to consider what stories, um, and it, it does rest with the, the game master, the designer of the experience whether or not it's of import to them that the outcome is the same or that the um, that the lessons are the same or that the themes are the same um, and kind of mm-hmm. which pieces they're going to adapt. That's an interesting question. Because well, I also, um, it, mostly because of the choices that you all made, you didn't really encounter any of the characters from the book. Uh, there was potential to, if you had chosen to try and infiltrate through the military camp, you would have encountered some of the characters from the book who were in the military camp. Um, Or if you had chosen for some reason to go over to the Neutropon plant, it's possible that you could have encountered some of the characters from the book there. But otherwise, your story was a completely separate story just happening in the same world. I just happened to place it near landmarks that someone familiar with the work would have recognized. Um... I could have chosen to put you somewhere else entirely, somewhere not even described in the book. Like you all could have been um, on a mission in, like I could have set the whole thing in Vancouver at your home base, or I could have sent you to um, Australia or to somewhere in like Northern Europe. And those places aren't really talked about in the book. I could have put you in Ireland, which is described slightly in the book, uh, and given you a story that developed out of the hints that were given there. I wanted, though, to tie it into the main action of the novel without directly affecting the main action of the novel, which Mm -hmm. that that's why I say that that was kind of the most challenging bit for me. So that just makes me really want to like set up a game where you play as the main characters in a novel and you make whatever decision you want to. I'm going to pick some sort of weird obscure novel <laughs> that I'm like confident none of the players have read and I'm going to make you be the main characters and I'm just going to see what y'all do in the same situation. 
I have some thoughts on that as well. I've thought about some like um, some of the more mind bending works that I've considered for this and just setting you up with here's the layout of where you are. You are these characters and and letting you go because some of the ones where it's more mind bending, some of the stuff from like uh, Haruki Murakami or things like that, where there's a bit of surrealism in it. I'm like, why not? Yeah. Yeah. And some of those kind of options um, lead into another question that I have about the themes of the work. So there were certain, um, certain themes and certain threads from the work that we were able to explore uh, but are there any other themes that you think that it would have been interesting to explore? And that's for anybody. I think the political, like, had it not been close to the U.S. election, uh, getting more involved with the political intrigue kind of side of things in, in this world was something that I was kind of interested in. Um, and it affected the, the backstory of my character a bit. Um, but it was not a good time. Um, but I think <laughs> it would have been interesting to, to think through the, um, the kind of contributing factors to decisions of politicians in this world as presented by the book. That is something I would have liked to sprinkle in a little bit more. Um, in the book, there are brief snippets of like interviews with the president or comments that he made to the press as he was getting on his plane um, that give a, a view into that part of the world. Um, and I managed to work in to the one shot uh, when you all entered the facility the you overheard the newscast, um, yeah. which was my way of kind of bringing that element of the book in, was that you could hear that newscast and kind of, uh, I don't even remember what what was in the newscast. I had it fully scripted and I just read it to you all. Um, <clears throat> but that was an aspect of the book that I wanted the flavor of without it taking up too much time. Um, it's the Petronella Page show uh, but yeah getting some of like the if there had been more locations or more time to have that kind of stuff I would have tried to sprinkle in like some of the quotes from Prexy um, but yeah taking it into an entirely different route and going and exploring the, the political angle would would be really interesting for this book I think I, my, my thoughts would be along the same lines of like, I was thinking more of, when I think of, I think of like Big Brother sort of like control, the oppressive, the oppressiveness of society as a system that we live in, but exists to ensure we don't like get out of line and how society can sometimes like go beyond what we need from it to become a burden. Um, like that's sort of the theme I think about the most when I think about dystopian, like because they take they take different forms. There's like the environmental stuff. There's, you know, corrupt government. There's all these aspects that show up. There's violence among youth shows up a lot in various ones. But I've I think at this the one core, too. <laughs> yeah, like the core of it, the thing that always comes back to me is like, there's a certain point when these societies that the people or the characters are living in start crushing them, which I mean, society is a man-made construct. We've made it because being alone out on the frontier and hoping someone doesn't just, like, walk up, steal your crops, and, like, murder you. Uh, it's better to have rules. It's better to have people to rely on. It's better to, like, disperse your skills across a wide range so one person doesn't have to try to both be a doctor and a farmer at the same time. But, like, it's so it's a practical thing that we do because it benefits us most of the time and I think the theme that always stands out in dystopian is that it no longer is beneficial and becomes that thing that's suffocating people sometimes literally but most of the time figuratively which I, which guess, I guess is, is one thing we could have 
delved, delved into, into more because there were protesters there, there and the military there, there and the corporation, corporation was there. there. It seemed, seemed like, like a politically tense situation. situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, but either, either we didn't go explore that anymore than, more than we could, could have. have but. Well, you were also given a specific mission. You were your mission was infiltration and and to stop this shipment from going out. Um, <clears throat> and so and you were not supposed to get caught. Um, so I, I had laid that up to, to pretty much guarantee that you were going to try insertion into the plant and, and destruction of the, the stuff as the way that this one shot would go. If this had been a regular campaign, you would have been open to explore many different things. Uh, but as it was a one shot, I was trying to guide you in where you went. Um, some of like the approach that, uh, that Jonathan that you took with going there during the day and infiltrating talking to um, Joy Ng who I made up on the spot uh, as the administrator that was there <clears throat> like that was not something I had scripted out or planned that was just okay sure let's explore yeah. this let's do Jonathan's this Jonathan's making things hard on me let's do this <laughs> But, um, and that's all good. Like, that's what role-playing games are, are like. It's collaborative storytelling. And your character decided to go off away from the rest of the party and and explore infiltration through that me- method. And that was a perfectly valid choice. Um, it wasn't one that I had anticipated, so I hadn't prepared stuff, but I think it went well. Uh, yeah, I did. I did ponder when I chose to do the face whether this was going to be more of a a challenge. Like, so that that's the challenge of a face in one of these stories is they're very good at lying, infiltrating via like social means and all this other stuff. But that also sort of assures they need to work alone because mm-hmm. if you come and you're like I'm supposed to be here but there's somebody standing behind you who's with you who very obviously doesn't need to be here <laughs> that ruins like what you're doing and so when I was thinking about the face I was a little I was sort of like I'm not sure what I don't know what we're going to be doing so I don't know if this is going to end up where I'm just isolated from everybody or if like I'm a distraction and my backup plan, if the whole like go through the front door didn't plan, didn't pan out, <laughs> my next plan was to go cause a riot among the the like young people who were camping, mm-hmm. and and essentially like go there like fake an injury, and and like convince them that like the army was attacking or something, and try to get them all riled up, <laughs> and then when the distraction was happening, like then being like everybody like in 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 like there's I, the craziness is happening out here um sort of yeah. thing um and and that so, would have been like, an interesting approach <laughs> <laughs> that was that was um, my backup scheme if if getting in the door the other way didn't work <laughs> well because the confrontation between the military and the young people uh basically timing wise happens immediately after you all would have left town like yeah. it it was coming so bringing it and making it happen earlier would have just been that really interesting to me being familiar with the book because that confrontation between the young people and the military happens. Um, yeah. Like it was a powder keg waiting to go off. And so had you set it off as a distraction, that would have been, um, that would have been an interesting move. And secretly in the book, there's a character named Clara who sets it off. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but uh, because you chose to go in, we, we ended up with, um, with Joy Ang as mm-hmm. the um, executive who happened to be on site and, and met with you and took you on the tour. Um, and we also got Luna Jones, who was that receptionist who um, was really excited to get that water to take home to her baby. Uh, yeah. Bless and, her heart. And so we, we ended up with that kind of more personal story that kind of brought it to the individual level, which is something that the novel really does you you see a lot of different individuals and the direct impacts of stuff on their story and um i mean i, d- I will so say that i like that i will say that the interactions with those two the the two characters not not joy she seemed like a 
corporate shill, but she was. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the security guard too, Muhammad, because um, he also was trying. He was like getting the water and was all excited about it. Um, yeah, they were just did, everyday workers. Yeah, I mean, it definitely did sort of drive home like, um, like the importance of what we were doing. I guess mm-hmm. would would be the way to phrase that. That yeah. like, it's easy when you're when you're doing like spy games and that sort of story that you're not really heroes. You're sometimes criminals, and like and like you're doing shady stuff, and so, um, that really made me feel like oh, actually we are heroes, um, and I need to go destroy this baby's water before <laughs> this baby drinks it. Uh, yeah sort of thing if I'm going to make sure because I, I did write that into my backstory that my character was um, basically uh, which it, it didn't really come up but one shot backstories never come up that's just sort of nature yeah. mostly I write them because I want to know how my character would react to things um, but I mean it was in her backstory that she had been like infiltrating these sorts of places just over and over for funsies and um, had found something that she didn't understand but knew was very very dangerous and so had made it like her her sort of like job slash task to like ensure that companies couldn't do these things secretly essentially and so it ended up tying out really well this like idea of like here's a company doing something really terrible and here's this person who's going to suffer from it and my character being like i gotta try to do something to like make this not happen yeah. well and, and i had set you all up go ahead go ahead no go ahead oh I, I was gonna say i had set you all up with um your spy agency sanitation that existed to um address environmental threats to the world like your entire core mission as a spy agency was um to essentially improve things uh and, and to address threats to the continued existence of humanity on the planet um so that already kind of set you up with a mission a core mission that was uh put you in good stead to be heroes yeah yeah that kind of gentle framework i think is super helpful for a one shot especially right like why would we all be part of this organization if we don't have a shared goal of dealing with these environmental issues um and we've we've touched on a couple of uh of pieces particularly for clara um but for uh for philip do you feel like your character was well suited for the adventure and then if if uh, jonathan wants to add anything about clara or were there things you would do differently I think now, we have, now yeah, that I, you know what happened we, we, yeah, yeah, we, we had, had fun, fun when we, we actually started infiltrating and, and, and getting, getting into, into it. it. I, I think, think the, the rate, 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 reconnaissance stuff that we, that we did, did for the, a lot of the first part, part of the game, game. I, wish I wish we just, just had, had, had that added to us, us the reconnaissance, so we could just gone straight to the fun part. We actually spent a lot of time on reconnaissance. Which I think if I had done a... If play I'd had the chance to do a play test of it, test, yeah. I would have probably started you later in the day. I started you too early in the day. You had too much time to work with, uh, which is what <clears throat> delayed that. I mean, it gave some really good role playing, but it also that role playing was one character doing a lot of that. And there wasn't much for the rest of you to do until the actual infiltration started later in the day. And so for a one shot, had I had the play test, I probably would have adjusted it so that you all were starting with a much more of a time crunch mm-hmm. so that you had to basically go straight to the infiltration. But that, that reconnaissance was best suited, suited for, for Clara's abilities. It was. And getting, 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 getting in there. there. But it wasn't, wasn't my, my character. character. My, my character, character was, was more suited, suited for the action, action with dexterity and moving about. Yeah. So. So. My character had you, basically like all charisma. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Your character, Pesky B, was really good for the uh, tumbling through the laser field, mm-hmm. <laughs> which you got to do. Yep. <laughs> yep, yep. Even, Even though, though we learned that's not how lasers work. work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah. it was based on spy movies. You got to tumble through a laser field. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what's a spy yeah, movie? That, that was exactly what you could go for. Um, funnily enough, I, I remember you all reacting strangely when I described the um, the emergency exit ramp instead of the ladders. But it was it was this thing where I was like, you know, I'm just going to make as much of a world where everything is accessible as possible. Because why not? It's a dystopia, yeah. but that doesn't mean that things can't be accessible. So yeah, the tube to go down to the aquifer that was just a narrow like manhole in the ground, that had a ladder. But an escape route from a facility and access to get to the upper levels of the facility, anybody should be able to get to those. So I built them in my brain and then probably didn't do a great job describing them, but hey, they were there. I think the reason I was surprised yeah, I was by that was... Interesting. Um, was Evil the, Corporation. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> I, so it comes back to, there's one of my Even favorite Evil games. Even Evil Corporations get sued. For accessibility well, issues. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Even if we're the political, political question again too. <laughs> like, like, what, what is, is the, government the government focusing, focusing on? on? You know, you know like, like if they're they're, they're, they're not, not regulating, regulating the safety of the water in corporations, but they're regulating um, accessible, accessible escape routes. So, so it reminds me, and I think this is like the core of my thought process on it is in in the game Portal Two, you hear all these like dialogues from the CEO of the company. And there's one where um, they were he's he's talking about how they hired a per they were trying to hire somebody who was in a wheelchair and he refused to do it and he was like and the lawyers were like you can't just not hire him because he's in a wheelchair and I was like not doing it ramps are expensive and that's what I've always <laughs> pictured for like when you talk about a dystopian like future is like someone who would be like I'll get sued over it it's fine I'm not bothering sort of mm -hmm. thing so i think that's why i was surprised is because i was but stairs are cave, bullshit yeah so. <laughs> like picturing cave johnson in my head of like the as the as the person who's running this water factory because this sort of nonchalance of like safety <laughs> is is the <laughs> cornerstone of someone who would who would also ship a bunch of water because they might lose some profits otherwise yeah yeah uh, one of the things um that would have been interesting to go and explore further um, was the whole idea in the book of the corporate corporate profit motive um, <clears throat> because essentially in the book rather than cleaning water they will create a new product that is a water filter so that they can sell it. it the corporations polluted the water in the first place but instead of uh, the in the book, the corporations have so much power um, and they're very dominant and they're basically on the level or slightly above the level of uh, national governments. Mm. Um, and so even though they're the ones polluting the water and causing all of the environmental contamination, rather than forcing them to clean that up, it's flipped. And, and just for the everyday consumer you're not focusing on, well, stop polluting. You're focusing on, I need clean water. And so that's how they end up buying bottled water to feed to their babies, buying uh, in-house water filters to filter the water that's coming to them to take out the pollution that the same company they're buying the water filter from put into the water. Uh, and so the, the cycle of the corporate profit motive and the uh, how it ultimately abuses the consumer um, is just a really interesting aspect of the book that would have been interesting to explore. But that's real life, though. Um, like, wasn't it? Yes. Wasn't it BP that like started the campaign for like your personal carbon footprint? Like I think I think it was I think it was BP <laughs> or it was, it was one of the it was one of the oil companies that like started so that idea. You're now touching on why this book has often been called. <laughs> prophetic yeah um many aspects it was written in 1972 and uh it was during the george w bush administration that people were reading it and saying this was really prophetic and then when i read it again 
last year in to prepare for the one shot i was like wow so so many parallels to today um and just even like the characterization of the president in it that was one of the things that they were talking about during bush's era of like oh well prexy comes off like bush but then reading it last year i was like wow there's a lot of parallels between prexy and trump and just so many things so many threads that are in this book that was written in 1972 that feel like they could be just describing our world it's really sad that when we when we look at a book and we go this book it was prophetic it's always like dystopian novels (laughs) (laughs) like why can't it be like that really like happy cheery book about how great we're all doing now i don't know where's where's the (laughs) isaac asimov like (laughs) we're all gonna be you know amazing i need to look at utopian novels now yeah, see if any of those are prophetic. Yeah. Maybe it's because we're reading all the <laughs> the dystopian ones. <laughs> Maybe. Um, let's see. We've already we've already talked a little bit about um, about NPCs. One other thing that we've we've gotten into a little bit, but I would like to talk about a little bit more before we get into our last few questions to wrap up is any advice that you might have Anthony for um, someone who's designing a one shot like this for the first time. Um, So as a fairly new game master yourself, um, do you have any advice for someone who might be interesting, interested in adapting a work and running a game? Um, Don't, (laughs) I'm going to say don't over prepare. Um, there's definitely work that you have to put in. There are, you need to have some fully fleshed out um, NPCs that you're ready to bring in. You need to have a list of names for NPCs you need to make up on the spot. You need to have an idea of the spatial geography that people are going to be moving through and the general plot that you're anticipating. But you want to leave enough flexibility for the players to go off on their own and and just be able to adapt and make something up on the spot so don't over prepare is is definitely advice i would give um i feel like i did a bit of that myself i was up until the last minute i was like i don't have enough put together i'm not ready i don't know what i'm doing um i had a little bit of panic going into it but um once we actually started playing i was comfortable in the world that i had put together for you all um and that i think is the most important thing is like know what world you're putting them into know what have an idea of of what is around them Uh, because once you start playing you'll be able to describe they're going to ask questions for clarification and you can make something up or or already have a prepared description Um, it takes more time to prepare I think when you're new at this so I definitely took more than uh probably more than 40 hours of work putting this together just because I did too much preparation. But uh, (laughs) when you're new at it, it's definitely going to be more than a couple of hours of work. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. That's a great point of kind of building. um, Yeah, 40 (laughs) hours is a lot. Uh, Yeah, 40 hours was way too much. But (laughs) I was also really worried because it was only the second one I'd ever done and I was doing it live on the internet so I over prepared way too much I think having a good sense of that (laughs) context is really important and even if you don't have the specifics if you know how you're going to get the specifics when you're asked um, yeah having that sort of strategy like a list of names and like or places and kind of what you anticipate you might need but there's no need to flip back through dozens of pages of notes to find that one receptionist name, you know? Yeah. I think yeah. That's I had a list of names. It was at the bottom of my document. 
Um, and I had made sure up front, because I wanted a diverse world. So I made sure up front that the names that I had prepared were from a variety of ethnicities and backgrounds um, so that I could just pull them in. Uh, because if I was making up names off the top of my head, it would have been like John Smith. Right. <laughs> yep. A lot one of friends. I would add, one thing I would add to that, too, is three hours or so, depending on how many long shot your one shot's going to be, seems like a long time. It is not a long time for people to do stuff. And almost inevitably you will make too much like even even when you get good at it and you've made a ton of one shots like it's still easy to be like i just made 10 hours of content and i <laughs> i think i made three hours of content <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah that's that's sort of it's hard to it's hard to get over that too yeah, i do think content. adapting a work there were so there's so many details there's so many like iconic things in the book and it was uh, a lot of my preparation was figuring out is there any way I can work this in is there any way I can pull this aspect and bring it in uh, or do I need to sacrifice this so like we lost the little quips from the president but I managed to pull in the Petronella page show which was very iconic um, I, so a lot of my preparation time was going back and digging through the book and like here's this thing that I had made a note that I wanted to add is there any way that I can stick it in where would it be appropriate do I need to just give up on this um, because I wanted it to be identifiable for people who were familiar with the work I wanted them to see those little details of the world um, and that added complexity to trying to prepare a one shot so I just I thought of a strange parallel like when I was a when I was working on my English degree one of the thing like when you go to write a paper you sit down and you work on a paper and you're putting everything in there and you get eventually you get really good at like incorporating things and writing these very long papers that go into all these things in detail and then I had a professor who challenged me to turn around and write a paper that was like two pages long and it was one of the hardest things I'd ever done and I'm now like what you're describing because I, I know that like I was thinking about that with the Alice in Wonderland and the Sandman was like how much should I what should I include and I sort of approached it from the opposite direction of like what is like core core bare minimum has to be in here versus mm -hmm. like what can I take out from like starting from the longer list um, but it still comes down to the same thing of like how do I pare this down into a format that can't handle a novel that's you know, 170,000 words or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it's, well, the same, me, it's the same question. Yeah. There was the core plot, which the core plot of the novel is the parallel that I gave you for your mission. The, the contaminated water is the core plot of this novel. Um, and so that was there. So then from then on, it was me trying to pull in the atmospheric elements mm -hmm. to make it feel like it was in the same world. Uh, which is why things like Petronella Page came in, um, because that is an atmospheric element that becomes tied to the main plot later in the novel, mm -hmm. but that you hearing a, a television or a radio that was on when you entered a room allowed me to add that element, and I could have added it no matter what room you entered. I could have just, oh, you you entered a room... Or you entered a tent in the, the military camp and you overhear from the radio this broadcast. Like, so I could have added that was an atmospheric element that I had that could just be slotted into a slot wherever I needed to, to bring in that bit of atmosphere from the novel. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a great tip. <laughs> um, pro tips. Let's see, we've got... Yep, pro tips you come to this uh, podcast from pro Roll tips. Call. That's right. I've <laughs> um, got a couple of kind of wrap-up questions. Uh, first, uh, do you feel good about how you resolve the conflict? Um, do, we, do we feel like we saved the day? Do we feel like we saved a day? Or a morning? Uh, <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah kind of rather than kind of fast at the time, time but, but what we did, did we did pretty, pretty fast, fast, but it wound up, up with a nice conclusion. conclusion. You know, I worried about the fact that, like, we destroyed the water, but we didn't destroy all the water. Like, people had some in their offices they had some like in their vehicles i'm sure they had them like spread around and like i tried to throw in like that caveat at the end but we were running out of time that like my character would have snuck back in the base and destroyed that woman's like water she was taking home to her baby that she left behind her desk um i i loved that little tag <laughs> yeah uh, because i was like i I mean, it still hurts some people. Like, we got the majority of it, which is fine, but the people we know it's going to affect and we, like, uh, are close to because they've told us about their lives are still in danger, essentially. Mm -hmm. Like, that woman's baby is still in danger. Uh, Muhammad is still in danger. So, for the most part, yes, but... Sadly, they both probably die. Yeah. I mean, Uh, I assumed we all died by the end of this... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> from what because i know in, of the an, book. because in another in another month's just time all of the water for all of denver is contaminated with that and the entire city erupts into uh psychotropic paranoia um hmm. yeah solid solid <laughs> fun fun time story for, <laughs> for, 20, for 2020 <laughs> Yeah. But you prevented the water from shipping to New York City. Mm. Uh, so Denver, which you had no idea that it was going to to be affected in that way, um, you didn't get a chance to save. But you did save um, the fictional contamination of New York City that I had created uh, that was not in the book. But nobody, um, but nobody in New York told me about their baby. That is true. <laughs> also true. Yeah. I'll right, take well, it. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, kind of a forward-looking question to sort of end on here as we start to wrap things up. Uh, what other works of literature or media? do you think could have given a similar experience as this session? And so the purpose of this, we can think about either for nuggets that someone might be able to build a future one shot on, or for our audience, if they're interested in this kind of story, what are other pieces of media that they might want to explore? Any thoughts? I mean, I just keep coming back to A Clockwork Orange, mainly because I've been thinking about how I would adapt it for a one-shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, there's, I don't know. I don't think that's a great comparison, though. A Clockwork Orange is, isn't is really an environmental... Th- I think I think at least for this one-shot, and, uh, and, the, and the way, from what I understand of the book, the environment and the impact of this dystopia on the environment is a major core part of it and I don't think that's the major core part of A Clockwork Orange. They're still dystopias but I think they're dystopias for different reasons. So Mm -hmm. I keep coming back to that but I don't think it's a great parallel ultimately. I feel like I thought about iRobot. iRobot where they have robots that are going to turn hostile. hostile. Mm. It has that same idea of a company company that's putting out a bad product product. then there the the company is kind of taken hostage to by that own product. That has some similar themes. themes. That'd be interesting. And that could still be spy e yeah. ad- addressing that kind of uh, an issue. Yeah. 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 Well, well, an iRobot is a, a, an interesting example anyways because like from story to story, the relationship with the robots changes. Um, and it changes so drastically. Like some of them, like like you said, you're literally imprisoned by them. And then in other situations, like they're viewed as like saviors. And right, right. So, so that's, not, that's not really dystopian. dystopian. Well, it's it's, it's like, yeah. weirdly dystopian, right. and mm. I mean, I, I think I think Asimov wanted a world where you understand that whenever we do have to deal with robots and AI, it's going to be a very difficult and nuanced situation. But some of those stories seem like like a dystopia where you can't like uh, the one I always think about is the one where they're on. I think it's on Mercury, and the robot is in a loop. 
and he he's the only one that can save them and they're about to die but he's just stuck in this dumb loop and they have to try to figure out some way to get him out of it or they're gonna die and i'm like that's a dystopia if you're like i'm gonna die from like overheating on this planet because this this robot essentially has a blue screen of death uh, <laughs> going on like that that's what that feels like to me but so i think um the other dystopian novels like uh uh Fahrenheit 451 or Brave New World, I I don't think that they would have given the same experience as this. They they have very different <clears throat> aspects of dystopia, as the others have been saying. I think uh, more the environmental apocalypse type stories, um, the that I was talking about liking B movies of uh, earlier. Um, I think they would give more of the similar type of experience. The one that comes to mind is a, a novel by George Stone that's just titled Blizzard, um, where it, it, in the novel uh, it's so hot. It's super, super hot. And then all of a sudden it just triggers an environmental change and a massive Ice Age blizzard comes. Uh, it And um, kind of the world that's described and the environmental issues that are going on that ultimately lead to uh, an oncoming ice age um, I feel like that would have more in common mm. with the environmental mm. issues that are explored by this novel I think you could also make an argument for Cormac McCarthy's The Road like it's, an, oh, it's a dystopia due to how terrible everything is but I mean you are <laughs> the reason it all happens is because we we ruined the environment we killed the environment essentially like it's completely dead and so we're just trying to survive long like basically like it has that it has that sense of like nihilism like we're all going to die because of this um we're all just seeing how long we can last because how can we survive if you can't grow crops you can't have animals you can't do all the waters crap like all these sorts of things that we ruined um, and it's and so I'm trying to remember. I think the reasoning what we did is also very vague. And if somebody wants to correct me on that, I don't know that it ever explicitly says what we what happened. There's I think there's an implication of like nuclear winter and war, but um, I can't remember the exact cause. So I can't I can't say for sure. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I'm not sure. Hmm? I also. Not directly the same, uh, but another one that comes to mind as potentially providing a similar type of experience, um, and one that I may consider trying to do a one-shot from in the future, is um, Isaac Asimov and Robert Silverberg's Nightfall, um, which is about a society that uh, is on a planet with six suns and once every like 20,000 years or something. Uh, so, so you're saying they align they're... in such a way so that there is a night uh, and they actually see the stars in the sky in, in, and the dark sky um, and it leads to madness and things like that. And so like the, the themes of uh, the psychotropic effects of the drug or of the contamination in this novel, um, I feel like would, would be similar if I had chosen to explore that aspect of it. I could have gotten a similar type of experience from that book. Planet with six yeah. suns just sounds miserable. Yeah, <laughs> that's really terrible. Um, it's, I, a, it's a good book based on a short story. If if you've never read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, it is not, strictly speaking, a dystopian future, but um, African futurist Nettie Okorafor has many stories that I think are definitely um, very fruitful for this sort of exploration. And I recently heard LeVar Burton read Mother of Invention, where there's a sentient smart house that is protective of this um, new mother. And kind of thinking about this tension between um, the affordances and also the risks of technology and the impact of kind of what humans have done to, uh, well, to crops and to the environment and how that can become uh, detrimental 
to us uh, in ways that we didn't anticipate is, is kind of a kind of core tenant of that story um, and is something that I thought was really interesting and really made me want to read more of her work um, because I think there are some interesting overlaps there um, and a lot of interesting ideas to to consider potentially for future uh, stories that might be worth playing through um, yeah but I think maybe at some point we'll assemble uh, recommendations from roll call potentially if this is uh, a consistent thing that we end on because um, I think like future reading uh, is helpful uh, but also just to have a list of some ideas for folks who are preparing for uh, future sessions of the role of play it's always good to have a spark um, some things to look to for that uh, and if you are watching out there and you have ideas uh, you can share those with us uh, how should they share those with us Jonathan oh they should they should if they have ideas for one shots they should email uh, role of play r o l e o f p l a y at dash g at vt dot edu uh, and we will we will happily take your suggestions um, you can also email that address if you have any questions about what we do uh, and stuff like that uh, as well there is also a link to a form you can fill out which hopefully someone will post in the chat maybe me we'll see I'll go post it <laughs> Yeah, we would love to have folks um, who are um, local to the Blacksburg, uh, New River Valley area, um, or folks who are affiliated with Virginia Tech in one way or another, uh, take part in future role of play streams. Um, and Or people that are, work in libraries. Yeah. Or me people who work in libraries. Yeah. If you're... Um, yeah, if you're just a, if you're a librarian and you want to or work in a library and you want to be on the show and come talk and talk about literature, play through one, let us know. And if you have never run a game and you're interested in adapting a work and running a game, we can assist you with doing that. Uh, so if you want to try your hand at running a game, we're we're open to helping you through that process. Yeah, definitely. Well, that link is making its way into the chat on Twitch. If you are watching us live, thank you so much for being here with us and bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Uh, if you are watching this or recording later or on a later broadcast, thank you so much for uh, spending time with us. And we look forward to having you. There we go. We got a link in the chat. We look forward to having you uh, with us again in the future. We are going to have... Uh, a new game next Friday, um, a new game of role of play, and each Wednesday we have uh, archival adventures on the channel. Um, so you should definitely check that out. And Anthony sharing all kinds of fascinating things uh, from the uh, the archives in our. Um, I don't know what the thumbs up is from the <laughs> archives uh, in our University Libraries of Virginia Tech. Um, yep, this, uh, this upcoming Wednesday, I'll be sharing um, items from the International Archive of Women, International Archive of Women in Architecture. Uh, so that should be nice. interesting. There's and some really cool to do photos I've seen yeah. in that collection. We're going to try to do roll call on a regular basis every other week, Thursday. Hopefully maybe? closer to when the actual uh, yeah. gameplay session airs. Yeah. Yeah, we yeah. tried to front load this a little bit so we can catch up. That's the hope. So I think, uh, is there anything else? Uh, I'll announce who we're going to raid. No, I think we're, we're good. Thanks so much, everybody. All right, we're going we're gonna to raid the Roll20 app. Uh, there's some people playing some role-playing games. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to send you out over there. But first, let's all say bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.